right, let's find our seats. Good morning again. <clears throat> One thing that's become clear to us in studying the Psalms on Wednesday night is that all these Psalms are to be understood first and foremost as the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The only one who never wanted anything beyond what his father was able to give him was the Lamb of God. So, in um, Psalm 25, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. And let not mine enemies triumph over me. A believer knows his number one enemy is his own sin. Lord, don't let my sin triumph over me. Make me, make me to trust you. Let's uh, open our hymnals together to number 58. And Tom's going to come lead us. Number 58. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Uh, I was thinking to myself, I thank the Lord that I'm, I'm not a very smart man. And I think that's a good thing for me. Uh, as Brother Greg says, you know, they, those much smarter than I want to debate about this is messianic and this one's, I'm not that smart. 
Say, I thought this whole book was about the Messiah. So uh, to me, it's not very bright from Genesis to Revelation. It's a messianic book. And how could the Psalms not be any less? And this Psalm is both of Christ and of David. And the more I thought about that, this is a book about Christ and his church, how he saves sinners. So I pray he would bless the reading of his word and speak to his people. David cries out, and Christ cried out on the cross, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. That's a believer, isn't it? We know our sins forever before us. In verse 4, against God and God only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. That's why he's crying for mercy, toward when judgment comes. You're justified in sending me to hell. And unless Christ intervenes, that's what I've deserved. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. You ever had your bones broken? Has Christ broken you? If you're a believer, he has. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is our call today. Cast me not away from thy presence and renew a right spirit within me. Verse, this is what I want to see, verse 12. Restore Unto me the joy of that little three letter word, thy salvation. I looked, you know, that's in the God's word 28 times, thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. That is our daily plea. Uh, Christ at the cross. He needed God the Father to restore to him the fellowship he had with his Father. It was lost at Calvary for just a few moments when God turned his back and poured his wrath out on his son. But we also need God to restore. That's to replace that which was no more. You know what? We restore furniture that, to put it back to its original condition. You know, Greg, you said restore that which was lost. I need God to restore to me the, see that word, joy. Now we try to teach the young people there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness depends on our circumstances. Joy is that deep river that never dries up. And that's how the believer can pilgrim through this world, knowing that the salvation of my soul written in his salvation it was his salvation he gave it to me that's a comfort I have I, I tell you that thrills me I don't know if it excites you but that's the only reason I'm able to get up in the morning and continue going I know that Christ is our salvation and it's my joy I pray that it be yours let us go to the Lord in prayer Lord, we confess to you this morning, we agree with what you said about us, that we are nothing but sin, and we can do nothing in our own abilities to save our souls, that we are completely dependent on you, Lord, for all things, and we ask 
that you not hide your face from us. We ask, Lord, that you would send your spirit to us and especially to your chosen servants, our brother, that you enable him, Lord, to speak Christ to us and remind us of the joy that he has done all the saving. And we ask that you give us the faith to believe it, put it in our hearts and our minds, and that you would give us the ability to give you all the glory. And we plead, Lord, for those who are gathered with us, who are strangers to this joy, that you might be willing, we know you're able, to save them. We ask it, that Christ take this prayer and that he make it acceptable. Let's all stand together once again. We'll sing hymn number 44 from your Spiral Gospel Hymns hymn book. Number 44. seated. Adam. Adam, Sharon's going to bring special music.
Thank you, Adam, for that. That was a blessing. <clears throat> Sinners are always humbly calling. Lord, make me. Don't pass me by. Don't send me away like the rest of that crowd. Will you open your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 65? <clears throat> Somebody may have thought that the term or phrase holier than thou was just something that uh, we came up with to describe the self-righteous. But here it is in the scriptures. You have your Bibles open, Isaiah 65. Look at verse 5. Which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou and God says these are a smoke in my nose a fire that burneth all the day there are but two opinions that you and I and every single ever person, every single person of this world has of themselves. One of two. You're either holier than thou or you are the chief of all sinners. There's no in between. No exception. All the righteous believe themselves to be unrighteous. And all the unrighteous believe themselves to be righteous. So you are either holier than thou, which God says is a smoke in my nose, or you are the chief of all sinners in need of grace more than anyone else now I hear someone thinking 
Well, you know, there's a lot of things that people do that we, we don't do. I pray to God he'll restrain us from doing some of the things that the world does. Lord, keep us. Don't, don't let us. But we're not, we're not judging ourselves by the world. You see, the difference between those who believe themselves to be holier than thou and those who believe themselves to be the chief of all sinners is the standard by which they judge themselves. That's it. Man by nature judges himself either by himself and tries to convince himself that he's getting better. And he has a holier-than-thou attitude. Or he compares himself to other men. And he's convinced that he is better than most. And he has a holier-than-thou attitude. So you either believe yourself to be holier-than-thou, or you believe yourself to be the chief of all sinners, because the chief of all sinners has but one standard by which he is able to judge himself. And that's the sinless one. He's found himself standing in the presence of a holy God, and he's naked in his presence. God sees everything. And he realizes, to whom much is given, much is required. And he knows his sin better than he knows anybody else's. He knows the unbelief that remains in his heart. And, and, and he thinks to himself, I don't know of another person in this world that's been afforded as much blessing, as much light, as much grace, as much privileges as I have and remain as unbelieving as I am. And he says with the Apostle Paul, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And the more he grows in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more he sees of the perfection of that sinless one, the more he sees of himself and the more he becomes the chief of all sinners. So I ask you, who's the standard by which you judge yourself? The conclusion will be either that you are holier than thou or you will find yourself to be the chief of all sinners. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground. There's no exceptions. Either one or the other. You either stand in the presence of God, depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ to present himself as your righteousness and looking to his shed blood as the only hope of having your sin put away. Or you're just like everybody else in this world. Comparing yourself to other men. Say, well, I don't do that. I don't do that. Now, here's the Here's the glorious blessing to this truth that I've just declared to you. The way God sees people is just exactly the opposite of the way they see themselves. Now, whose opinion is most important? You see, God sees those who believe themselves to be the chief of all sinners, he sees them in Christ. He sees them righteous. He sees them truly holy. A person who would say, stand off from me. I'm holier than you. They have no idea what holiness is. Absolutely no idea. You can't achieve holiness. I don't care how many things you, you, you restrain yourself from doing or how many good works you do. 
This, this truth is so clearly illustrated in the story that the Lord told about the publican and the Pharisee. The scripture says that the Pharisee went to the temple and he prayed thus to himself. <laughs> Pretending to pray to God, he's actually talking to himself. He's bolstering his holier-than-thou attitude. And he says, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. Extortioners unjust, adulterers, I don't do those things. And I'm especially thankful that I'm not like that publican over there. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift his eyes up to heaven, but smote himself upon the breast, and he cried, Lord, have mercy upon me. The sinner. The sinner. I'm the only one. I don't know about anybody else. I don't know about anybody else's life. I don't know about anybody else's heart. But I know my own. Lord, I'm the sinner. I'm the chief of all sinners. What a contrast. Holier than thou or chief of all sinners? Which is it for you? one or the other. Now, the way God sees us is just the opposite of the way we see ourselves. And in our text, beginning in verse 12, the Lord tells us what these holier-than-thou people look like to him and he says but thus saith the Lord behold I will extend peace to her I'm sorry I'm, I'm in the wrong I'm on the wrong page um, Isaiah chapter 65 um Verse 2, Isaiah 65, verse 2. Remember verse 1 is, I am sought of them that that ask not for me. Uh, The Lord Lord, Lord, uh, calls out those who would not show any interest in him. And that's why we are brought to say, why me, Lord? Why me? And now in verse 2, he's going to describe these ones who believe themselves to be holier than thou. And he says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. They continue to rebel against me. They will not bow. They will not believe. They're in obstinate rebellion against my grace. They hold up themselves to be holy in and of themselves, and uh, they will not come. Which walk in a way that is not good after their own thoughts. (laughs) They're not walking after Christ. They're looking to their own righteousness. They're, They're believing that, well, The Lord gave another example of those who will stand before him on the day of judgment when he divides the sheep from the goats. And the goats will say to him, but Lord, but Lord, we've done many wonderful works in your name. We've cast out demons. We've been around the world. We've evangelized. We've preached. We went to church. And what's the Lord say to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Depart from me. And then he looks to the sheep and he says to the sheep, I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me to drink and I was naked and you clothed me and I was a stranger and you took me in. And and what do the sheep say? (laughs) 
What do the sheep say? Lord, when did we do those things? You see, believers don't take notice of what they're doing as their righteousness before God. These people, God says, are walking in a way that's not good. They believe themselves to be good. That's why the Lord asked the rich young ruler, Why callest thou me good? There's, no good but, there's none good but God. There's none able to do that which is good in the sight of God but God. That's why Christ came. He came to do that which was good. That's why the Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock and I'm going to cause my goodness to pass before you. And that's why we preach Christ crucified. The Lord said, And I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Oh, Lord, enable us to look to Christ for all our goodness. I have no goodness outside of him. But they walk in a way that's not good. According to their own thoughts. Why are their thoughts so perverted? Because they've got the wrong standard. <laughs> you see, the holier than thou folks are comparing themselves to themselves or they're comparing themselves to other, other men. And so they're walking according to their own thoughts, thinking, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And God's describing now those who believe themselves to be holier than thou, who say, stand off from me. And God says they're rebellious people. They're not walking in a way that's not good, that's good. They're not walking after Christ. They're walking in a way after their own thoughts. And God says, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. You see, everything that God, everything that's true, Everything is true. It's just the opposite of what man by nature believes. What he believes to be good, God says, your righteousnesses are as filthy rags before me. And the believer says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Truth, Lord, as that Syrophoenician woman said, truth, Lord, I am a dog. But the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Would you spread a few for me? Would you be merciful to me? I know I'm a sinner, Lord. I know I have no goodness. I know I have no righteousness. I can't walk after my own thoughts. I have to walk after your thoughts. So God is giving us his thoughts. The way God sees us is just the opposite of the way we see ourselves. You want God to see you holy? <laughs> you want him to see you accepted, sanctified, Perfect in his sight. You're going to have to believe yourself to be the chief of all sinners. The only way you're going to believe yourself to be the chief of all sinners is if God's pleased to reveal Christ to you. It gives you a different standard by which to judge yourself. The holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, son of God. God's pleased with him. He's pleased with him. And all those who stand in his presence say with brother Job, Behold, I am vile. Look at verse 3. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face. Now, what is it that provokes God to anger? I am absolutely certain that the God of glory, the holy God of glory, is provoked to anger much, much more by what happens in lighted church buildings with folks that are dressed up and, and outwardly moral and being outwardly religious than he is by darkened bars and whatever you want to imagine. What I'm saying to you is that our God's more offended on Sunday morning than he is on Saturday night. Now, what are those folks on Sunday morning doing? They're pointing at those folks on Saturday night, aren't they? Which the problem is, most of the folks on Sunday morning are the folks on Saturday night. 
And they're coming to church to try to atone for their sins. But what is it that provokes God to anger? Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. You see, the person that's bound up in some sort of debilitating sinful behavior is more likely to look to God to be delivered <laughs> than, the, than the person who's going to church on Sunday morning thinking, I'm holier than them. I'm holier than them. And men do it all the time. They cast out one demon and get seven more, more strong than themselves. The demons of religion are much stronger than the demons of this world. And when God says they provoke me continually to my face, they gather together in, in church buildings on Sunday morning and they open my book and they use my name and they pervert my truth by their self-righteousness. They believe themselves to be holier than those folks and they provoke me to anger continually to my face. And the child of God says, Lord, I'm just, I just need some mercy. I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm worse than those folks out there. Hey, preacher, what are you talking about? Hey, look, there's things we don't do. Again, I, I, I hope that God will restrain every one of us from doing the things that would shame him. You know, people talk about wanting to live for Christ. I'm much more concerned with God restraining me from shaming him than I am trying to figure out how to live for him. There's a whole lot of folks out there in the world that are, that are, that are promoting themselves as living for God, being a witness for Jesus. And they don't even know the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, restrain us from that behavior. But here's the thing about it. The chief of all sinners sins in his heart against the light. He's sinning against truth. He's sinning against what he knows to be true and right. And he's so grieved by his unbelief. Those folks outside of Christ are just doing what's natural to them. Sin is not natural to a believer. It's just not. It's contrary to everything we believe. And yet we keep doing it. They, those holier than thou folks. He's talking about religious people here. He's not talking about the Saturday night folks. He's talking about Sunday morning folks. And he's saying they provoke me to anger because they walk after a way that's not good, after a Jesus who can't save. They worship a God who doesn't exist. They pervert my truth. They talk about me as if I'm powerless. And they put themselves on the throne of God. And they provoke me to anger daily. Continually. To my face. They sacrifice in the gardens. <laughs> oh, they come together in, in, in beautiful edifices of religious worship. And they make their sacrifices to God. And they burn incense. Upon altars of bricks. Now God said he made it clear in the law. In the Old Testament when they were to make an altar. Not only was it not to be made out of bricks. Which are handmade. But it wasn't even to be made with stones. That had a hand put to them. They had to stack up stones that had never been hewn. They'd never been chiseled. They'd never been. You know you don't take the edge off the gospel. You don't try to take the offense out of the gospel. Those stones are Christ, and Christ is offensive to these holier-than-thou folks. And now he says there, they didn't just take rocks and hewn them to, to, to take the offense out of the gospel. They're actually presenting their bricks as a means of the, of, of, of the altar on which they... You remember the Tower of Babel? After the flood... Scripture says the people met together in the valley of Sinar, which was the name for Babylon before Sinar. 
And it was changed, the name of it was changed after that to Babylon. And Babylon is seen all throughout the scriptures as, as man-made religion. And Babylon in Revelation is being destroyed by God. These are the holier-than-thou folks. These are the folks who dress themselves up and talk about God and live for Jesus. And the Lord says, I'm going to destroy it. But where did Babylon get started? It got started at the Tower of Babel. And the scripture says they had brick for stone and slime for mortar. And they built this city with a tower reaching up into heaven. What were they trying to do? They're trying to get to God. Trying to reach, reach heaven. And that's what man-made religion is all about. You know, if you just submit yourself to the rules and regulations of our religion and, 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 you, and you pretend yourself to be better than other folks, you can, you can achieve holiness. You can get into the presence. You can work your way into the presence of God. Just keep stacking bricks. And what were the children of Israel doing in Egypt when they were slaves? The taskmasters had them making bricks, didn't they? <laughs> and that's all religion is. Religion, man-made religion is just slavery. It's bondage, bondage to the law. But what did they put those bricks together with at the Tower of Babel? By the way, why do we call it the Tower of Babel? Because God confused their language after they built this tower. And what do we hear in the world today? A lot of confusion, a confusing language. Well, they say I got to do this, and they say I got to do that. And the truth is, the only thing between, the only difference between one man-made religious opinion and another are the sets of rules and regulations that that particular group puts down for you to live by. They're not preaching Christ. They're holier than thou. <laughs> now, they put these bricks together with slime. Now that's tar. That's pitch. You don't have to know much about construction to know that, in the, that, it, that, that over there in Babylon, if you build a building out of brick and put it together with slime, it might stay together for a little while in the wintertime, but as soon as it gets to be about 120 degrees, all that slime is going to melt. And that brick, that, that building's coming down. Uh, the word slime is the same word that Noah spoke of when he pitched the ark from within and from without. Now, tar works really good as a water repellent, and it worked on the ark. It was a, it, the word there is the word atonement or covering. And Noah pitched the ark on the inside and on the outside in order to keep the judgment of God's wrath from coming in on, his, on him and his family. And the only thing that's going to keep the wrath of God from us is the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that our ark would be pitched within and without. And pitch works, as I said, good as a water repellent. It doesn't work good as a mortar. But what do the, what is the, what the holier-than-thou folks do? They take the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, his atoning work, and they try to hold together their works that they put together with their hands by the truth of the gospel, and they mix law and grace. Rarely will you hear of a message of salvation that's purely works. It's always a mixture of works and grace. Always. You see, nothing's changed. Men are doing the same exact thing today that they did in Babylon. They're worshiping God in gardens, and they're putting together altars of brick. And God says, if it is grace, it can no longer be of works. Otherwise, grace is not grace. You can't mix grace and works. <laughs> Either God did it all, or he won't do it at all. He does it all by himself. He's going to get all the glory. He said, I'll not share my glory with another. <laughs> not going to do it. And the chief of all sinners says, amen. Amen, Lord. Oh, I would never think. Lord, I don't want to rob you of your glory. I want you to get all the glory, Lord. What, what glory do I have? What do I have to offer? What can I do? All I've got is my sin. 
So I say again, either you and I believe ourselves to be holier than thou, upon which God says, you are a stench in my nostrils, or we believe ourselves to be the chief of all sinners, upon which God says, justified. That publican and the, and the, and the Pharisee, after the publican smote himself upon the breast, and the Lord said, which one of those two men went down to his house justified? <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. We know exactly which one went down to his house justified. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. The word Pharisee, the Pharisee sect of the Pharisee started in the second century B.C., and they were basically religious separatists who saw the decline of Judaism and, they, and they, were, they were zealots for the law. And the word Pharisee actually means separated one. So does the word holy or sanctified. It means separated one. Now the only difference between the holier than thou and the chief of all sinners is who does the separating. That's the only difference. You separate yourself, you're a Pharisee. You're holier than thou. God does the separating. He calls you out. He makes you to differ. And now, he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all as one, so that he's not ashamed to call them his brethren. The Lord loves his, his people. He's the one that made them to believe themselves to be chief of all sinners. They've got altars of bricks held together with slime, which remain, uh, look at verse 4. Here's the, here's the definition. Here's what God thinks about the holier than thou. They remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments. Now, some of us have been there. Some of us read way too many Puritans and worshipped way too many dead theologians. And we settled all religious arguments based on what Dr. So-and-so used to say. You know the Puritans are the ones that, that burned witches and that made, that made people walk around with red letter A's on their, on their, on their coats. Hey, they were such legalists. But they were Calvinists. <laughs> And we settled our theological differences based on what some dead theologian used to say. Here's the only, the only, the only thing that settles anything is what saith the scriptures. I don't care what Dr. So-and-so, Dr. Sounding Brass or Dr. Tinkling Symbol used to say. It don't matter to me. Now, there's some men that I think preach the gospel. And I can't figure out why they said some of the things they said. But you know what? They're not our source of authority. People say, well, well, you know, Spurgeon said or Calvin said or, you know, I don't know why they said it. I can't go back in time and figure that out. I know what God says. <laughs> His word. We're not living in monuments. We're not going back to, 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 get, our, to get our authority from the grave. Which eats swine's flesh. And broth of abominable things in their vessels. Unclean things. They're not feasting. What is the only thing that's clean? Once a month we celebrate the Lord's table here. And we eat that bread. And the Lord said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat. That's the only thing that's clean. This is my blood which is given for you. Take and drink. For lest you eat of my body or drink of my blood, you've got no part in me. My flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is your drink indeed. And there's anything else you eat. 
Anything else you feast on as a hope of your salvation is unclean. And yet, what does the world do? What does the religious world do? They look to their experiences. They look to their works. They look to their wisdom. They look to some dead theologian. They look to what they do on Sunday morning. And they're, and they're feasting on these things. And they're satisfying their, their flesh with these things. And what do they say? Stand by thyself. You stand over there. Don't get near to me. Don't get near to me. You see, the believer's heart, now, it, believers don't think that way about, I don't care what people are doing. We look at folks and we think, but for the grace of God, <laughs> oh, Lord, I, I, Lord, I could be an unbeliever. I could be bound in those things. I could be doing these things. Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. And a person who has that thought or expresses that opinion about themselves in comparison to other folks have no idea what holiness is. No idea. Christ, the only one that's holy. There is smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written, verse 6, before me, I will not keep silent, but will recompense, even recompense unto their bosom. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You thought what you were doing was measuring up to my standard of holiness, but it was iniquitous. It was uneven, unequal didn't measure up all your works were iniquity those things you thought were good those things that thought stood you out among other men made you better than other folks God says I'm going to recompense them to you you see the basis on which you and I come to God is the basis on which he will judge us I'll say that again the basis upon which you and I come to God is the basis on which he will judge us. If we come to God based on our works, based on our holiness, based on our acceptance, he says, I'll recompense that to you. I'll give you what that deserves. Judgment, eternal damnation, hell. Now you come to me based on that one who is good, that one who is after my thoughts and after my heart, that one who is holy, <laughs> and I'll recompense to you a reward for his sake. Holier than thou or chief of all sinners? Which is it? Don't you love being around the chief of all sinners? I love being in this group. I know, I know the vast majority of you believe yourself to be the chief of all sinners. And what a joy. You know, we, we, it, there's, no, there's no controversy. There's no argument. There's no, there's no attempt to try to, to try to prove ourselves above one another. It's not like religion. We, some of us have been in religion. You know, I... I I, I pray God will keep me. Oh, I know I've got to be kept. Every day I've got to be kept. But I can never see myself, even if the Lord was to take his hand off of me. Oh, I, I shouldn't even say that. But if he was, I couldn't go back to religion. That was the most miserable life. Everybody pretending to be something they weren't. What a blessing. We don't sacrifice in the gardens. We don't offer incense upon altars of bricks. We don't lodge in graves and monuments and eat swine's flesh. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, trusting him alone for all our righteousness. 
Verse 7, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work unto their bosom. I'm going to give to them exactly what they deserve. And I'm going to meet them on the very ground on which they are coming to me. Look at verse 8. Now close. Thus saith the Lord. Don't you love hearing those words? <laughs> Let man have all the self righteous opinions of himself he wants to have. Let him think that he's holier than other folks all he wants. Here's what God says As the new wine is found in the cluster, one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. Now the Lord's talking about that vineyard which he planted, that, that uh, Jewish Israel, which the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to. And he, said, he says it's like, a, it's like a, a, a dried up vine. It needs to be cut down. But then somebody notices, wait, wait, there's a cluster of grapes in there. <laughs> Don't cut it down because there's a blessing in there. You see, all the blessings of God are in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of them. And he's that cluster. He's that blessing. And he's not going to destroy the vine. No. He's going to graft into the vine. The Gentiles. He is the root that sprang up from dry ground. He is the one that treaded the winepress of the fury of God's wrath. He is the new wine which cannot be put in to an old wineskin. But that's what the holier than thou's try to do. Just like they try to mix the atonement with their works of brick, they try to put the new wine into an old wineskin. God says, no, you don't need to have your heart changed or improved. You don't need to turn over a new leaf. You need to have it taken out. <laughs> and you need a new heart, a believing heart, a regenerated heart. And the, and the chief of all sinners says, oh, Lord, give me that heart. Give me that heart. Lord, cause me to believe on you. Cause me to find the blessing of the new wine in this cluster that's hid in this grapevine which is not producing fruit. The new wine is the blood of the new covenant. And the Lord Jesus Christ took that water. First miracle he performed first miracle the wedding feast of Canaan and isn't it significant that it was a wedding feast <laughs> what the Lord said I'll not drink of this wine again until I drink of it at the wedding feast and I gather together my church in glory and this is the wine of the new covenant this is my blood which has been shed for you you sinners those of you who know you have no holiness outside of Christ, but in him, you're perfectly righteous in the sight of God. He didn't make it look like wine. He didn't make it taste like wine. He turned the water into wine. Changed it. Lord, I need to be changed. I, I, I see that lurking Pharisee in my heart that would cause me to have thoughts of being holier than thou. Oh, God, forgive me. Make me to be the chief of all sinners that I might depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone for all my holiness and all my righteousness. Our merciful Heavenly Father, that is our prayer. Oh, how we hope that you'd be merciful to us. Cause us to rest our souls on thy dear son. For it's in his name we ask it.
Let's stand together. Number 232. 232. sing this without music. Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save. All he has promised that he will do. Wash in the fountain, open for sin, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Judgment is coming, all will be there, each one receiving justly his due. Hide in the saving, sin-cleansing blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Great compassion, O oh, boundless love, O oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you.